It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics when they stand at that podium. They speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 117th season of the Empire Club of Canada. My name is Antoinette Tamilo. I am the president of the Empire Club of Canada and your host for today's virtual event, Here Comes the Boom protecting deposits and financial system during the post-pandemic recovery, featuring Peter Rutledge, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation, and Vanmala Subramaniam, Capital Markets Reporter for The Globe and Mail. I now want to take a moment to recognize our sponsors who generously support the Empire Club and make these events possible. Thank you to our lead event sponsor, Fleischmann Hillard High Road, and our season sponsors, the Canadian Bankers Association and Waste Connections of Canada. I also want to thank our event partner, VBC and LiveMeeting.ca, Canada's online event space for webcasting today's event. Now for a few logistical items. First, if you're finding your internet feed is slow, please see below and click the switch streams button. And don't hesitate to press the request for help button that's available to you if you're experiencing technical difficulties. Our team will be happy to assist you. I also want to remind everyone on this call that this is an interactive event. So make sure to send in your questions. We have reserved some time at the end to um, handle those questions. It is now my pleasure to call this virtual meeting to order. The last year of the global pandemic has had catastrophic impacts on the Canadian financial system. With multiple stages of lockdowns that have limited business and impacted the economy, it is important for Canada to have a recovery plan. Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation plays a role in this recovery. CDIC protects close to a trillion dollars in bank deposits and is a key part of Canada's financial safety net. Today, we are joined by CDIC President and CEO Peter Rutledge as he tells us about Canada's economic volatility in post-pandemic life. He will also discuss how CIDC contributes to making our financial system more resilient to failure which supports financial stability, a key element of economic growth. But first, let me introduce our speakers. Peter Rutledge was appointed president and CEO of CIDC in November, 2018. 
where he leads a team of professionals to support the corporation's vision to earn the trust of Canadians as a global leader in deposit insurance and resolution. Prior to joining CDIC, he was senior advisor at the Department of Finance. Mr. Rutledge has extensive experience in Canada's financial sector, including serving as managing director of research at National Bank Financial and leading the Canadian Financial Institutions Group at Moody's Canada. He holds an MBA from INSEAD in France and a bachelor's degree in business and economics from Simon Fraser University. Van Mella Supramanium will be moderating after Peter delivers his keynote speech. Van Mella is a reporter with the Globe and Mail covering capital markets for the reporter for the report on business. Previously, she worked at The Logic where she covered Canada's tech sector with a focus on how legacy industries are adapting to the innovation economy. She also did a stint at the Financial Post as the cannabis reporter. Van Mala also created and led Vice, Canada's money vertical covering personal finance, labor, and the housing market. She began her career as a television producer at CBC, working on various business and current affairs programs, including the Fifth Estate. I would now like to invite Mr. Rutledge to deliver his keynote speech. Good morning and uh, thank you, Antoinette. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thank you, Antoinette, Antoinette, for that kind introduction. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the Empire Club for this opportunity to discuss the post-pandemic challenges that uh, lie ahead of us. Je tiens également à remercier le Empire Club pour cette occasion de discuter les défis post-pandémiques qui nous attendent. Let me begin by acknowledging that I am speaking you to you today from Ottawa uh, and from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I thank all the generations who have taken care of this land. Today, I'd like to share with you CDAC's view uh, of the economic landscape and the risks that we at our little institution monitor that could affect our large, some of uh, uh, our larger member financial institutions, as well as our smaller financial member financial institutions. Uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll take up a, a few minutes notably to discuss the housing market because it seems to be a topic of some interest uh, in recent weeks. I'd also like to tell you about our role uh, as a Crown Corporation with a specific mandate assigned to us by Parliament and the tools we use to fulfill that role. Uh, to support financial stability and to protect depositors. CDIC is an institution that's been around since about 1967. Uh, we ensure the deposits of uh, our federal member institutions. Those are institutions that hold a federal deposit taking charter. They could be banks, they could be trust companies, they could be federal credit unions. Uh, we ensure upwards of, uh, or just about, uh, $1 trillion in deposits, and our coverage <coughs> limits are seven, or so, pardon me, $100,000 per deposit category per institution. Uh, that means you can have more coverage if you have more deposits at different institutions. And at each institution, the seven categories independently can go up to 100000 in coverage. So in theory, Canadians could have up to $700,000 in CDIC deposit protection uh, at each of our federal member institutions. So let's talk first uh, about the pandemic um, and our recovery from the pandemic. Like all of you, I'm preparing to step into post-pandemic life. In fact, I am quite eager to do so as evidenced by my attire this morning. This is about the, th the third time in a year I've worn a suit and tie. Um, more people are vaccinated every day. The Bank of Canada expects Canadian real GDP growth to be positive and healthy in the first quarter of 2021. That said, new more transmissible variants of COVID-19 are, are a present danger, and we in Canada are taking special measures to combat them while we also increase vaccinations. Although near-term uncertainty remains elevated, 
the medium term outlook is fairly robust with some with some prognosticators positing a very robust recovery in North America. Over the past six to nine months, some of those prognosticators have articulated that viewpoint of elevated exuberance within Canada's residential real estate market, prompting understandable concern about the housing market. This is not a new challenge for Canadian regulators and policymakers. In fact, looking back over the last 12 years, the story of Canada's residential housing finance system is a story of a successful interplay between the productive spirits of a marketplace and disciplined, measured, and ultimately effective prudential boundary setting by policymakers and regulators. Policymakers and regulatory authorities have so engaged more than three dozen times since 2007, by my count, with the end goal of a healthy, robust housing finance system that has moved Canada closer to the vision of every Canadian having a home that they can afford that meets their needs. Last week, the superintendent announced, the superintendent of financial institutions, one of our partners uh, in the federal financial safety net, the superintendent announced another measured, intelligent response to the productive spirits of the housing finance marketplace, a proposal for the qualifying interest rate for uninsured mortgages. The minimum, pardon me, the minimum qualifying interest rate or stress test adds a margin of safety that ensures borrowers will have the ability to make mortgage payments in the event of a change in circumstances, such as the reduction of income or a rise in mortgage interest rates. In my view, this proposal will reinforce sound residential mortgage underwriting and thereby bolster the safety and stability of Canadian financial institutions. You may be asking yourself, well, how does CDIC, the deposit insurer, factor into this housing discussion? And why are we paying such close attention? Let me try to explain. Our job at CDIC is to protect one critical component of the Canadian financial system, deposit taking. We insure, as I mentioned earlier, $1 trillion in deposits from individuals across 85 member banks, federally regulated credit unions or loan and trust companies. Our job is to be ready for a highly unlikely but high severity financial distress event within our membership. We know that the economic recovery from the pandemic will be volatile and unpredictable. Indeed, the marked ebullience in the Canadian housing market of late is an example of that. Volatility goes both ways, upside and downside. And we know from prior experience that the costs of volatility may fall unevenly across the financial institutions in our membership. So we have an interest in housing market developments because they could have an effect on our member institutions and therefore our risk exposure as deposit insurer. So how do we manage this risk and also protect deposit taking in Canada? Well, uh, there's a relatively simple answer to that question and it's an answer provided by parliament. The CDIC Act gives us four key responsibilities or objects in this regard. One, to reimburse depositors within CDIC's deposit insurance limits. Two, to promote financial stability. Three, to do those first two things, protect depositors and promote financial stability in such a manner that minimizes CDIC's exposure to loss. And four, we act as a resolution authority for our members. You may notice there is a tension in those responsibilities. That tension is intended. It is the tension between an obligation to protect depositors and promote financial stability on one hand and avoid what we call moral hazard on the other. Uh, the avoidance of moral hazard idea it shows through in our third object. To, to promote financial stability, protect depositors in a manner that minimizes CDIC's exposure to loss. 
Parliament asks that we balance our objects and thereby balance the tension between the avoidance of moral hazard and the promotion of financial stability. Timing is critical in these events. When a deposit taking institution falls into financial distress, we can minimize losses and promote financial stability when we act early as opposed to late, but it's not quite that simple. There's a fine line to walk. First of all, we prefer to let the market do its job. If a private sector solution occurs, such as the purchase of the trouble bank by another, then CDIC need not get involved. We prefer to let the market do its job because acting too early can lead to moral hazard. Anytime a party does not have to suffer the full economic consequences of a risk, moral hazard can occur. Therefore, we don't want our member institutions to take reckless risks in the belief that CDIC will eventually bear the financial losses produced by that recklessness. A good rule of thumb is that shareholders and other capital providers should, should suffer losses before CDIC and other senior creditors. Alternatively, responding too late to the deterioration in the financial condition of one of our member institutions could trigger, could trigger contagion or a loss of public confidence, which could destabilize the financial system and result in much higher costs to CDIC. As I said earlier, there is a profound tension at the heart of our resolution preparedness for deposit-taking institutions. To get at that tension, to manage it constructively, Parliament has granted to CDIC two broad sets of tools to manage this tension, and I'll, I'd like to describe them for you right now. The first set of tools provides CDIC with a bounded capacity to act before the point of non-viability. Non-viability is another way of saying failure. We have a wide array of tools available to us, including but not limited to guarantees, loans, recapitalization, and loss sharing arrangements with the buyers of failing institutions. Another second set of tools enables CDIC to intervene after the point of non-viability, a point determined by the superintendent. These powers are quite substantial. For example, we could reimburse all insured deposits immediately following the declaration of non-viability by the superintendent, and afterwards liquidate the institution via the Winding Up and Restructuring Act. We could vest shares or assets of a non-viable institution to force a sale of the member to another healthier institution. We can establish a bridge bank into which we would transfer the failing or failed institution's good assets and certain liabilities. For systemically important banks, and there are six of them here in Canada, we can convert capital and certain debt instruments, not deposits, into common equity and thereby recapitalize the banks. To maximize the value of these tools, we must have sound preparatory practices in place. Preparatory practices that help us and prepare us to use them in the very unlikely a circumstance where we would have to use them, where we had a rebel member institution approaching a point of non-viability. Uh, I'd like to outline for you three such critical practices, and I'm going to list them according to their distance from the point of failure or the point of non-viability. So the first and furthest away is resolution planning. We do this every day here. In fact, Canada's six largest banks, the systemically important banks, have developed detailed resolution plans in coordination and collaboration with CDIC. And over the last 18 months, we've turned our focus towards developing resolution plans with smaller institutions. But plans aren't enough. But in fact, uh, I think as General Eisenhower said, uh, no plan survives first encounter with the enemy. So we must apply those plans in a real world setting to truly understand their effectiveness. So how do we do that? We've been blessed with uh, a 25 year period of uh, no member institution failures at CDIC. So we don't have real world challenges to help us uh, with that task. So we do what other first responders do. We simulate failures. In other words, we routinely conduct war games to play out financial crises in a safe environment 
so we can test our resolution plans and coordination. We hold a number of these each year of differing size and complexity. So far, they've been either internal to CDIC, with our board of directors, or with our federal government, financial safety net partners. Down the road, we will expand them to include uh, our member financial institutions. Our third tool, the one closest to the point of non-viability, is we have the authority to seek early collaboration with troubled members. Since the mid-1980s, mid we've had the power to conduct an in-depth examinations of the assets and deposit liabilities of member institutions whose financial condition gives us cause for concern. Through these exams, we can anticipate problems and respond sooner to a potential failure before too much value and capital are, lo are lost. Undertaking such a special examination has the unintended though eloquent and unmistakable consequence of sending a powerful message to the boards of these institutions. The COVID pandemic has stressed to the maximum every element of our economy and financial system, and the recovery will present new and unpredictable challenges. Yet Canada's financial system remains strong and resilient. If one, CDIC, if one of CDIC's member institution does fall into distress, Canadians can rest assured that we have strategies and a toolkit in place to protect them, to protect depositors, and to prevent the spread of financial contagion. Since CDIC was established in 1967, it has handled 43 failures, affecting more than 2 million depositors and more than $26 billion. And no one has lost a penny of the money that was insured by us. Depuis sa création en 1967, la SADC a traité 43 défaillances, touchant plus de 2 millions de déposants et plus de 26 milliards de dollars. Et personne n'a perdu un sou de l'argent que nous assurions. So thanks very much. And Van Mala, I'm looking forward to uh, questions, to your questions and to the audience's questions. Thank you so much, Peter. That was a good introduction into what the CDIC does. I'm also looking forward to this. Maybe, you know, we'll just start with kind of taking a step back and talking about last uh, March when we kind of realized we were in a full blown, blown crisis. I, I just want to ask you, was there at the time at the CDIC a legitimate fear back in March, April 2020, that there would be a run on the banks? Because I remember there were conversations about people saying we need to take out more cash, like there was definitely a feeling that we had this huge crisis on our hands. So maybe give us some color on the kind of conversations that were taking place uh, between yeah. you and other economic leaders at the time. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, the direct answer to your question, were we worried about a run on the banks? The, the direct answer is no. Um, we weren't uh, certainly uh, myopic in understanding that the system had absorbed an immense uh, shock. Um, but we, you know, we at CDIC, uh, certainly, and I, I, uh, I would certainly hold this perception about our federal safety net partners. We'd been preparing for volatility since the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And so very early, you recall, we uh, after the immediate lockdown in March of 2020, um, there was a rather strong uh, and concerted effort by the monetary policy authorities at the bank and then um, the financial I mean, the fiscal policy authorities of the Department of Finance to provide uh, support and relief over a, that period of, of volatility. And so I, I was fairly confident that uh, that, that was going to work. Um, what we did notice uh, very early was our trouble indicators. Uh, and so we monitor social media, we monitor website hits, calls to our um, calls to our office were blink and red. Um, they were at levels that we hadn't seen since 2008 and nine. And so that told us uh, for that period, you know, from mid-March to mid-April, um, folks were concerned. 
um, and they needed reassuring messages. That's why the, you know, the, the fiscal and monetary stimulus were hugely important to that. It settled capital markets relatively quickly. Um, and then what we did, knowing that there were some Main Street worries, was uh, up our presence in media and remind people, look, your deposits are safe. And so uh, we basically quadrupled our target imp targeted impressions uh, on television uh, and then began to experiment quite creatively with social media to try and get those same reassuring messages across. And uh, I'm not sure I, sh I would have wished this, uh, or wished the pandemic, in fact, I certainly know I would not wish the pandemic on anyone. Uh, sometimes crises do give you an opportunity and, and we had an opportunity to really expand our awareness. And now we're, we're up above our targeted awareness level of 60%. Uh, and so I guess we, you know, we capitalized on the crisis before us and tried to make something good out of it. And, uh, and we've got w awareness levels um, uh, above where we like to be in order to, to be comfortable that we're doing our job in promoting financial stability. Um, what, one of the things that, you know, the trends that we've all noticed in the pandemic is, I guess maybe we didn't anticipate this back in March and April, but people's savings rates have really gone up. Yeah. Uh, meaning that obviously the amount of deposits that the CDIC is insuring has gone up. I, I want you to maybe talk a little bit about the trends of deposits. Um, yeah. Maybe give us some context on why this is happening, what are Canadians doing with their money, and yeah. kind of how does that affect the CDIC that deposit, deposits are up? So we've, we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, and so let me just confirm your... <laughs> Your thesis, yes, uh, typically can deposits that we insure grow at about nominal GDP, so four to 5% a year. Uh, last year, they grew roughly 10%, and I expect, based on um, data from the Bank of Canada, that insured deposits at CDIC will grow another 10%. So we'll be up around 1.1 trillion when we next measure uh, at the end of this month, actually. Um, why is that happening? Uh, we did suffer an immediate employment shock, as everyone will remember, but then we had the fiscal stimulus that compensated for the loss of income and, in fact, more than compensated for the loss of income. I, I cannot stress how important that was in sustaining debt service uh, through that hard time last year, in addition to, to all the um, uh, forbearance from our member institutions that uh, they granted to, to their customers. Th those two things were just hugely important in sustaining financial stability through this economic shock. Um, but the fact is household income rose uh, as we went through COVID um, and employment's come back and uh, household income is still very, very high. Uh, not, not, I shouldn't say very, very high, but the step change in, uh, in uh, uh, household income is higher as a result of the return of employment and the extraordinary support facilities that we put in place last year. So savings would be higher no matter what, just because in household income is higher. And then you add to that the shutdown uh, and the fact folks, you know, they're not going on vacation as much. They're not going out to restaurants as much. Um, that has, you know, there's Canadians are spending less, simply put. Uh, and so that's adding to the savings and we're seeing a buildup in those savings in deposit accounts at our member institutions and therefore in in the insured deposit total. Um, um, what, how granular is the, is the data that the CDIC collects on deposits? And I ask this because yeah. I wanna know if there are any kind of outlying trends that you've never seen before on the way people are saving or who's saving, things like that. Um, let me answer the first question, which is how granular is the data? Um, it doesn't go down to the level of demographic data about Canadians. It's, it tells us, uh, we get data from our members that tells us their estimates of insured deposits, and then we can break it down into the type and category of insured deposits. But we don't break, um, or we don't ask our members to break that down into demographics. Uh, and generally, uh, unless we absolutely have to, we don't, we don't want a lot of information uh, private information on Canadians, just because we don't want the privacy or, or cyber risk of that. 
we try to be somewhat conservative and only reach for that information when we absolutely need it to prepare for a potential payout. Um, from what the, the data produced by the Bank of Canada available on StatsCan would, would suggest that uh, the run-up in savings has been broad-based uh, across uh, all demographics. Um, I mean, obviously higher income folks have a little bit more savings than lower income folks. That's just math. But the, the trends look to me to be fairly broad-based. Canadians, Canadian household income generally has gone up and spending generally has gone down. And so as a result, Canadians have a bit more in the bank and they should know their, those savings are protected up to our, our seven deposit categories, 100,000 per category. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the current state of the banks. Um, uh, the state, you know, just looking at the five to six largest banks in the country, mm -hmm. I've been covering the earnings quite a bit over the last few quarters, and the banks are doing really well. Um, yeah. They are making a lot of money because of M and A activity, because of trading activity. Does the fact that the banks are doing well give? the CDIC some degree of comfort right now? What gives us comfort is uh, A, the elevated capital levels above regulatory standards. Uh, you see not just across the largest six banks, but across our membership. Now that's thanks to a superintendent that's very prudent in setting the capital buffers here in Canada a little bit above international norms or standards uh, that gives us that that's a margin of safety that really helps uh, helps us at CDIC because it lowers our risk exposure. Uh, I get very comfortable or I'm very comfortable with the liquidity buffers we have in place that we've put in place really since the last crisis. Um, I'm very comfortable with the notion or, or the fact that you know in the immediate uh, quarters following the onset of the pandemic, banks uh, took loan loss reserves uh, before they actually experienced loan losses. And despite those reserves still being there, we haven't really experienced the loan losses yet, and hopefully we won't. And that's an additional margin of safety. So in generally, what gives me confidence about the resilience of our system is that there are uh, a degree of of buffers in place that um, are certainly, at least I've, I've followed the banks for a long time, they're unprecedented in my memory. And it's that buffer, that 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 buffer is a resilience uh, that, you know, God forbid something goes wrong with the recovery, there's a lot of buffers to absorb the unanticipated uh, and, and enable the financial system to uh, work its way through any unforeseen negative occurrence. Do you feel the same way about the credit unions? I don't regulate the credit unions, but I feel that way about our members. And we right. do have two federal credit unions. Okay. Um, I just want to move on a little bit. Uh, as you mentioned in your speech, you expressed support last year mm -hmm. when the CM former CMHC CEO, Evan Siddell, spoke out against you know, offering mortgages to people who might not be able who, to over leveraged home buyers, people might who might not be able to pay it back. Um, I just want to get your thoughts right now on the mortgage debt situation in this country. Do you see it as something that is unsustainable? Uh, I'll give you a clear answer to that. Uh, no. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned in my speech, the story of residential housing finance over the last 12, 13 years is the story of a, a productive private marketplace uh, creating wealth and housing for Canadians, checked by prudential regulators that, sit, that set prudent uh, boundaries and in order to uh, sustain or lean into you know, irrational exuberance. And I see that playing out right now. I saw that playing out in the CMHC's uh, decision last year to be a little bit more stringent on their uh, application of their uh, debt service standards to their uh, to insured mortgages. I see it in the superintendent's um, 
message from last week to uh, reformulate the mortgage stress test. Um, if you if you look back uh, over the history of the mortgage market since about 2008 or nine, there have been about a little over three dozen um, uh, initiatives taken to kind of uh, maybe narrow down the boundaries of the private marketplace. But they've been they've been done very 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 gradually and prudently. So for example. Back in 2008, you could get a mortgage insured with a 40-year amortization schedule. It's now 25 years. Well, we didn't jump from 40 to 25. It took us from 2008 to 2012 to go from 40 to 25 years. A very gradual but persistent um, building of a margin of safety in our, in our mortgage housing system, mortgage finance system. Um, and so we're going to continue to see that. Uh, the, I think, a continued gradual but persistent effort to make sure the housing finance system does its job, which is to provide uh, Canadians with uh, the housing they need. So just to confirm, you don't necessarily share the view that, you know, a lot of Canadians are over leveraged, especially in the pandemic when interest rates dropped so much and encouraged people to either refinance or, um, yeah, basically, you know, increase the amount they were borrowing. This this is something you think regulators are really keeping an eye on and keeping it in check. Uh, housing leverage, uh, so residential housing uh, leverage, uh, household leverage, uh, is, so quantitatively, it is a little north of 170, it, you know, three or four years ago is about 160. Uh, the reason why it's moved up, a big part of the reason why it's moved up is the cost of financing that that debt is lower, income isn't lower, so we so households can bear a little bit higher leverage. Um, I would like household debt to uh, income levels to come down. It, uh, CDIC's risk profile would get better if that happened. Not all at once, but gradually. Um, it is difficult for that to occur when you have a, of, of a lower interest rate environment. I think given the facts we have, um, I am not overly concerned about uh, household financial leverage. I think, I think that comfort I have is a product of 15, well, since 2008, so what's that? 13 years of persistent, prudent boundary setting um, that limits the ir irrational exuberance that can build up in a in a marketplace in a in a debt finance marketplace, capital asset marketplace like housing. Mm -hmm. So I'm very comfortable with the dynamic we've been in for the last 13 years. It's the same today as it was five years ago, as it was 10 years ago. And it's produced a beneficial outcome for Canadians generally. Um, I would feel better if household debt to income ratios started to trend down uh, gradually, non disruptively, uh, but, the, but that they started. And you can get that either by, well, you get that by basically income growing faster than debt. And let's wait and see. Uh, you know, we're about touch wood, I don't wanna jinx it but we're about on the precipice of a pretty good economic recovery. Let's see what happens to household income. Let's see if it starts to grow faster than, than uh, household debt. And, and that's, that's a beautiful deleveraging when your income outgrows your debt levels. Okay. Um, I wanna ask you a question about next week's uh, federal budget to see, uh, you know, do you, are you expecting anything interesting as it, I guess, relates to measures around financial stability? What are you kind of looking out for for next week? Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, as a public servant, I'm, I'm banned from talking about the budget. Uh, that's, um, that's something for the federal government to talk about a week from today. Um, uh, so I'm not really in a position to to discuss what the budget might contain. Um, but I, but like all Canadians, I expect the government will continue to respond to uh, the economic and fa financial events that pose a risk to stability. 
Um, last week, you saw the superintendent of financial institutions action, which I think is proactive and a useful way to uh, build resilience, both within our membership and with and with uh, and uh, within Canadian households. And so um, that is a good indicative uh, example of how federal uh, or regulatory authorities can build a margin of safety that ensures borrowers have the ability to make mortgage payments in the event of a change in circumstances. But is there anything you would specifically you might want to see in the federal budget since we have not tabled a budget in a while? Yeah, um, nothing that I'm um, in a position to discuss. I think I'd just like to wait and see what's in the budget before I comment on it. Okay, that's fair. Um, we have about 15 minutes and I have, there are many questions coming in. So I think I'm just gonna shift gears to audience questions for a okay. little bit. Um, there's a question from two people, Brendan and Harvey, about the level of coverage of the CDIC. Yeah. Uh, Brendan asks, is it time again to increase the level of coverage from 100,000? Harvey says, uh, when will, if at all, the CDIC increase the insured amount to 250,000? Is that on the table at all? So Brendan and Harvey, those are great questions. Um, the federal government did a deposit insurance review a couple of years ago, and we're still in the process of uh, bringing into force amendments that changed our coverage level. Um, as part of the review, we asked that question. And we ask that question every time we think about deposit insurance. And here's the answer we've come up with. The policy intent of deposit insurance is to cover as many Canadians in full as we possibly can. Um, and to be able to do that, uh, or the mechanism the federal government has chosen to do that, is to expand the number of categories we cover. And so we used to have three or four, now it's as up to seven, uh, by this time next year, it'll be eight. Uh, and so every Canadian at each of our member institutions doesn't have just 100,000 of coverage. She or he could have 100,000 in a simple savings account, could have 100,000 in deposits within an RRSP, within an RESP, um, and there are seven categories uh, that go on from there. So the, the, the policy intent was to expand coverage uh, by expanding the number of deposit, separate deposit insurance categories. Um, and in so doing, we've, we, we estimate we've, we insure about 98% of Canadians in full at their member institutions. Um, and so the, the policy intent from my perspective is very clear that uh, we, we increase our aggregate coverage for Canadians through an expansion of categories, not necessarily through an expansion of the, 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 the ceiling of 100,000. Okay. Uh, another question from Rick. Uh, preparation is great, but does Mr. Root Rutledge foresee small or large troubled institutions ahead in the near to medium term? My job um, is not really to foresee. My job is just to be ready. My job is to assume that, it, that, that a member goes into trouble uh, and then I have to be ready to act. So um, I, I, I liken our job at CDIC to like a, you know, you're a local firehouse, you're, 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 you're covering a local firehouse. You know, we have a large neighborhood uh, where if a house gets onto fire, you, get, you know, is set ablaze. Uh, we have to act pretty quickly to put it out, put it out to li limit the damage of that house and then to limit the damage to other houses that are nearby. Um, we don't operate in a world where, well, we haven't had a, a house on fire for 20 years. So um, let's, let's walk around as closely as we can and, and uh, try and predict of the thousands and thousands of houses we cover where we might have a problem. Our, our job really is to be constantly prepared to act when the bell rings and there really is a problem. So with the speech, what I was trying to get is how we do that every day. I'm not trying to signal that I expect um, a member institution fail. 
what I'm trying to signal is if it does, CDIC is ready. Um, we have another question kind of related from Shane. At what point would bail-ins from depositors be triggered? It's a great question. Uh, never. Uh, depositors will never be bailed in. So let me try and explain that. Uh, bail-in is a particular resolution tool uh, for only systemically important banks. Uh, and what bail-in does is it, uh, it defines certain liabilities, not deposits, that will transfer or convert common equity if the superintendent deems it that institution unviable. So let me try and explain a little bit more. Uh, not in Canada, but in other countries during the financial crisis, uh, capital at certain institutions all of a sudden evaporated. They became undercapitalized. And some governments uh, injected equity capital into those institutions, and those acts were called bailouts. And the view was, well, taxpayers were paying for the bailout of that institution. Uh, and Canada, along with many other nations, decided, well, we don't want to do that again. We don't want taxpayers to put a bailout. So how do we, how do we add capital in a crisis to an institution without putting that burden on taxpayers? So the idea we came up with is something called bail-in capital, where we ask our institutions when they're healthy to issue billions of capital instruments that uh, have, a con have contractual terms similar to debt, for example. But if something goes wrong, uh, they convert instantly to common equity at the uh, determination of the superintendent of financial institutions. Uh, and so they sell these instruments to the private sector. And the private sector inve investors understand and agree to take that recapitalization risk and price it into the interest rate they charge for those instruments. All those instruments are capital markets instruments uh, marketed to and invested in by uh, experienced capital market investors who price those risks. Positors are untouched. So if a systemically important bank in Canada, God forbid, ever uh, became non-viable in view of the superintendent, those instruments would convert to equity and protect the depositors at that institution. Depositors would suffer no loss. Thanks, that's very clear explanation. Um, another question we have from uh, Huston. Is CDIC able to share any information regarding observed deposit flows from smaller to larger member institutions during the pandemic? Um, you know, you can see, uh, I mean, we're, we can share information uh, that is publicly disclosed by our members who happen to be publicly traded. And we do have, you know, obviously the six largest banks in Canada are publicly traded, uh, as well as, um, you know, a number of uh, other institutions that are under our membership. Um, there, uh, within those, if you were to look at the sort of domestic Canadian deposit flows uh, mm -hmm. in those public statements, you would see a slight advantage to the larger banks. Again, those, inst those institutions have broader consumer platforms and the increase in savings has, has been weighted towards the larger banks. Uh, but we've seen a lot of really innovative um, activities by banks that uh, are challenging the big six. Uh, and there is, you know, the, the internet and uh, digitalization of financial services uh, is a competitive issue for the big six. And um, I'm, I'm not so sure that uh, immediate phenomena will always persist. I wouldn't add on that. Okay. Um, a question from Casey. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so I think time for about three questions. As we turn our attention to economic recovery, 
Will Schedule A Bank's healthy position give them room to be more active in the recovery? If yes, how? Uh, well, what I would, I would say to that is um, so far, we've had a uh, general buildup in equity capital uh, within our membership and earnings have sustained through the crisis. Um, and if we are indeed entering a period of, of more robust economic growth, then I think there will be strategic opportunities um, for some of our members and many of our mm -hmm. members. Um, how they choose to play it out, that's up to their boards and you know they have to accord with the basic capital rules. But you know, here's, a, here's an interesting inference you can draw from that. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, regulators uh, tend to set prudential boundaries in Canada in particular around a private marketplaces and then try their best to stay out of the way. Uh, and sometimes in setting those boundaries, we irritate market, market players and competitors. Well, as a consequence of some fairly prudent, careful boundary setting, the institutions in our membership have come out of it with strong capital position, healthy earnings, and perhaps strategic opportunities to create value for their shareholders. Now, that's entirely due uh, to their, uh, to, the, to the effectiveness of the management and the wisdom of their boards of directors, but uh, the authority setting those prudent boundaries um, didn't, in, you know, didn't impede that. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that. Okay. Um, I think we have time for just maybe one more question. Um, this goes back to our conversation about the housing market and, you know, leverage. Uh, a question from Ravi. Won't economic recovery put more money in Canadians' pockets, uh, increasing debt leverage even more? Okay, well, those are two separate things. So, uh, an economic recovery, and let's let's hope this happens. The sooner the better. An economic recovery will increase income across the country and uh, income at households. Um, Canadian households will then have a decision to make uh, in terms of how much debt they choose to take on and whether they choose to take on a higher level of debt in relation to their income. What experience teaches us is as rates fall, that tends to occur. And as rates, interest rates rise, that tends not to occur. So if we get uh, you know, a, a, a robust economic recovery, um, it's not unusual for interest rates to rise through that uh, economic recovery. And so that could in part be a counterpart to that. In addition, you've got a 13 year track record in the housing market specifically of federal authorities, again, in prudently, intelligently boundary setting in order to lean against, I think the, the underlying part of that question, which is the tendency, I got more income, now I can mm -hmm. borrow a lot more. Uh, uh, the, the, the prudent, uh, helpful, useful activity of regulators in that market is just to kind of try and lean into that, uh, those, those productive spirits to keep them productive and to keep them to the extent you can. And you can't, I mean, we have a free society here. We don't have complete control, but the extent you can influence more productive as opposed to destructive behavior uh, is, is a good thing. It, it, it enhances our resilience. And again, we've got 13 years where we've done this and uh, I challenge anyone to find a, a, a housing system like Canada's where we have had, you know, very, very productive marketplace driving housing valuations, driving construction of housing through household formation which comes from both natural population growth and immigration. And to have that done in a manner in a low and falling interest rate environment uh, and done in a manner where we, we basically have households that are able to manage and sustain their debt service, even through a once in a hundred year pandemic. It's a pretty good story. 
I feel like we could have a whole other 20 minutes discussing housing, uh, but it is five to one. So thank you so much, Peter. I really enjoyed that discussion. I hope all of you did too. Um, I'm just going to pass it back now to Antoinette um, and we will close off this meeting. Thank you, Vamela, and thank you, Peter. On a apprécié you. beaucoup vos commentaires en français. Ça n'arrive pas assez souvent sur notre plateforme. Alors, merci. My pleasure. I am now going to ask uh, John Capobianco, Senior Vice President and Senior Partner, National Practice Lead for Public Affairs at Fleischmann, Fleischmann Hillard High Road to provide the appreciation remarks. Thank you so much, Antoinette. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here this afternoon representing my talented colleagues at Fleshman Hill at High Road. With offices across Canada, we are a full service communications firm offering both public affairs and public relations services across a wide, wide range of sectors and industries, complemented by our in house creative team. But I'd like to especially give thanks and extend sincere thank you to our speakers, Peter and Van Mala, for an engaging, dynamic discussion about CIDC's role in Canada. I personally was aware of CIDC's deposit insurance, as I'm sure many of you were, but I did not truly appreciate the, to the extent to which they contribute to the stability of the financial markets in Canada. In uncertain times, it is certainly reassuring to know that CIDC is part of our regulatory network. On behalf of Fleshman Hillard High Road and our wonderful host, the Empire Club, thank you all for making time on your schedules to join us in our discussion today, and we wish you all good health and stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Um, and I, I again want to thank you both all for taking the time today. This was a very great discussion. Um, Vamela, it was great to have you back at the Empire Club. And Peter, it's nice to know. I'd love to be involved in one of your war games. I, that sounds yeah. absolutely intriguing just to mind, see how it, all, how it all works out. That would just be terrific. If I could just take a moment to tell you about uh, an upcoming event we've got um, scheduled, and it's Oscar season soon. So we've got Adam McGoyan and his son coming to speak to us with a few other people on diversity and inclusion in media and arts, a work in progress. So um, please join us for that. It's an evening event. Thought it would be more appropriate to have that kind of discussion at, uh, at one of our evening events. Registration for all of our events is free. And uh, thank you all again for joining us today. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>